Hi, and welcome to episode one of the Haskell Cast. My co host is Chris Forno. Hello. I'm Rain Henricks, and our special guest today is Edward Komet. Hi there. So, Edward, first of all, thanks for joining us today. No problem. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the Lenses Library, which you are, I think, most famous for. But first, maybe we can talk a bit about how you got into Haskell and what you've been doing in the larger Haskell community. Sure. Um, so I found Haskell um, by accident. Um, so I'd, I'd probably spent like the previous 15 years like writing little toy languages of my own. And they all looked like some bastard child of like C++ and Perl and Python and all those kind of like, you know, the mainstream imperative languages that everybody knows and loves. Um, and um, I'd been, I, I had some kind of inkling that like immutability was a good thing um, and that I wanted to build something that could use that and then I wanted to prove a big body of uh, provably correct code and I went off and I started playing with whore triples and whore logic and separation logic and all that. And um, along the way, um, to keep some food on the table, I wrote a JavaScript compiler in JavaScript. Um, it, it, it would make sense in context. Um, <laughs> and it compiled JavaScript with continuation passing style to JavaScript. Um, and I looked around, and there was um, this new ECMAScript specification that was coming down the pike that didn't happen because Microsoft said no. Um, but at the time, it looked like uh, ECMAScript was going to become a much bigger language. And I thought about implementing something server-side for it, and um, I looked around, and the language that it was becoming was closest to, like, Perl 6. And I looked at Perl 6, and the working implementation of Perl 6 was this thing called Pugs. And Pugs was written in this language called Haskell that I'd never heard of. Um, so to learn enough Haskell to understand Pugs, I, um, well, now I write Haskell all the time because <laughs> JavaScript is boring. Um, that's sort of the short, short answer. Basically, when I found Haskell, Haskell had better answers to all the, prob the questions I'd been answering or asking than I did. And, um, you know, as somebody who'd been programming for 15 years before that, you know, I, I'd been under the impression that there was nothing new under the sun. And when I found Haskell, um, it was it was more like a religious conversion for me than anything else. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I found Haskell. And then, uh, since then, I've just been writing all the libraries that I wish I had here. Um, and in many ways, that's been really good. Um, one of the nice things that I find with Haskell is that it helps me realize the... Uh, promise that object-oriented programming has always given us, that, you know, we can get code reuse. You know, object-oriented programming has always been claiming that we can get some percentage of code reuse. If only we had better discipline. Um, and in practice, what I find is that um, Haskell, uh, for a number of reasons, one being that it focuses on laziness, um, and the other being that it gives us um, uh, good support for heavily polymorphic types, the, the lends itself to um, getting all of that code reuse that we're promised in every other language that we never seem to get in practice. You know, you might get 5-10% code reuse in C++, and you might get more if you have a really disciplined shop and you're, you know, high CMLI, you know, you, you have high, you know, <laughs> commitment to those kind of goals. Um, but in Haskell, I find that the majority of my code actually winds up being reusable. Um, and that's something I've never had before. Um, and so what, what it's helped, let me do is it's let me sort of accrete critical mass um, with regards to libraries. I can actually start building things that I want to build, and then I can reuse them later and keep building on top of them. Um, and so, you know, people always ask me why I have so many libraries in Haskell, and it's really just because I can. Um, I guess that if that... <laughs> so that's kind of how I found the Haskell community and where I'm, you know, going with it. You took the question out of my mouth there about asking about Haskell libraries. I looked through your GitHub repositories and counted 107 of them as original yeah. Haskell repositories. That's about right. Plus, there's um, there's uh, there's an Ermine account that I have a couple of things on, and there's a an analytics account that has a few more account that has a few more, and there's a couple of other side projects that I have that are on separate GitHub accounts. 
Um, so yeah, there's probably about 130, 140 publicly accessible repos from me. And so also, you are a member of the Haskell.org committee? Yes. Um, I self-nominated or whatever to, to join that about two, two or three years ago. And um, I think now I also chair the Core Libraries Committee, which we just started. Um, with, and that's uh, pretty recent, right? Yeah, that, that is new. We, we started the Core Libraries Committee this summer. Uh, Simon asked me if I would be willing to chair... Which Simon? Uh, uh, Simon uh, Peyton Jones. Uh, Simon Marlowe was just leaving um, Microsoft Research to go work for Facebook. And I think Simon got the impression that he really wanted to, A fix the rather admittedly dysfunctional uh, libraries process that we've had, because up until now, um, anything that went into the core libraries that um, we couldn't get unanimous consent on, nobody felt ownership uh, of base or anything like that other than maybe Ian. And um, so really nothing could happen to it without everybody in the Haskell community agreeing. And there's always a voice of, dis of discontent, uh, no matter what you... Uh, uh, want to do. Um, and Ian also left recently. And then Ian just left too. That that was that was a, a second hammer blow that uh, I don't think anyone was really expecting. Um, so the, the the nice thing about the core libraries committee is it gives us like under the existing um, libraries maintenance pr procedure. There's a there's a notion that um, the maintainers decide uh, what what goes into their libraries. Right. The, the Haskell platform is this kind of distributed mishmash of um, all sorts of people in the Haskell community coming together to build something that they ship um, that, you know, all works together. And um, what would happen was that there, all the things that had to be used to build GHC were owned more or less by GHC headquarters, but nobody there really wanted to take responsibility for maintaining forward progress on those things. So um, the committee itself then forms a collective maintainer. So, you know, it's now seven people that have to get together to make a decision um, rather than um, everybody who happens to subscribe to a particular mailing list. Um, and we, can st we, we still want to take the temperature of the room. We still want to ask the community what they think. We still want to poll. We still want to ask. But, you know, the library's procedure has always been that, that we ask and then using that we inform our decision rather than necessarily it, lead by blind democracy. At some point someone has to make a decision. You can't exactly. wait for consensus. So, you know, a lot of things are starting to shape up out of this. We're getting the applicative monad proposal, and we're working on whether or not we can get foldable and traversable into base. Um, we should hopefully be able to do that for next year. Um, so that, a lot of our goals are to target 710. Mm -hmm. And then there's splitting out base into multiple packages, which, which uh, Joachim Breitner has been working on. And uh, that may be in 710 or 712. I don't, we haven't quite worked out the timetable for all of that. Um, so can you yeah. sp speak really briefly about the applicative monad proposal? Because if it's what I think it is, uh, a lot of Haskell developers have been grumbling about this for a long time. Yeah, we we wanted to have applicative as a superclass of monad for, well, since applicative came around. Um, and it's just now hit critical mass. Um, because the, the, the problem is, is there are a lot of points in the design space. Do you remove return from monad and just use pure from applicative? Or do you move return into applicative? All of those things... All of those would be great if we were starting from scratch with code today. Um, like, if applicative had been around all along, we could have done that originally. Um, Can you briefly describe the proposal for people who might not be familiar with so it? So the, the actual applicative monad proposal is very simple. All we do is we just take the existing classes for applicative and the existing class for monad, and we just say that applicative M is a superclass of monad M. Done. Nothing and changes. And what's, what's um, blocking some functions, that? Some functions become more general, like lift mm -hmm. and et cetera, just become lift an. So they start working with more liberal constraints. Um, yeah. Nothing is blocking it. As a matter of fact, we're we're heading forward with it right now. I think uh, I think it was David Lupashensky who came up with the proposal, and he was. I just got an email from Simon saying, "Hey, look, they want to push it in." So that may actually happen in seven eight. And how does that affect backwards compatibility? Um, the major impact on backwards compatibility is that if you have a monad today, you have to write the three lines or the one line worth of applicative code that you need to just write the instance for the applicative. Mm -hmm. um, that's about it. And you have, to have, you, have to have, you have to write your applicative and you have to write your functor instance. And in exchange, you can now use applicative sugar in all of your code that works with just a monad constraint. 
Right. And you mentioned this leads me. Go ahead. Sorry. You mentioned uh, something targeting JHC seven point ten or a number of things targeting seven point ten. Yes, we're um, so seven eight is coming out very soon, right? That should be coming out somewhere around ICFP this year. It's if in I September. understand it correctly. Yeah, so we're not doing uh, the committee itself isn't doing much of anything with regards to that release, um, and then we're going to focus most of our efforts on the subsequent release where we can try and see if we can come up with a version of the foldable and traversable in base like generalizing all the combinators that are in base that could we could be made to use foldable and traversable to do so. That way, base only exports one version of MAPM. It doesn't export two versions that happen to also be, that happen to conflict. Um, and is, and so we're, is, we're going to try and do that for 710, which would be next year. Next year. Got it. And is there I, anything... I think I may have misspoken earlier. Is there anything in 7.8 that you're excited to about? What's the general goal for that release? So let's see. What is going on in 7.8? 7.8 is giving us the new typable. Um, so typable has become polykinded. So now everything gets its own, uh, gets a typable instance by default. Uh, that's a big deal. Um, because like handwritten typable instances were actually a way to subvert the type system in many ways. Uh, there was a post by Bob Harper complaining about it. Uh, Oleg has written an article on the topic. I, I, was um, it some discussion about something being unsound? Uh, it is. You can, you can, you can. Right now, with with the existing typeable API, by making a custom typeable instance, you can subvert the type system and write unsafe coerce. Um, and that ceases to be a problem under the new system. Uh, it, it causes me some problems. It actually breaks a few things in Lens. Um, but I'm I'm willing and able to work around them. Uh, they break it breaks some of my code in uh, control exception lens and some machinery there. Is that likely to break application code, or is that mostly going to be breaking library code? Or is um, it relatively mostly going to be breaking library code. Library code. Um, if you had a handwritten typeable instance before, you're probably going to have to put a little conditional if def around it to say don't build it in. And this leads me to a larger question, which is what's the goal for GHC and the Libraries Committee in terms of backwards compatibility and the, <coughs> the avoid success at all costs mantra. Are you interested in moving the language forward at, at the expense of backwards compatibility? How do you find that balance? Um, I am generally, how to put it, the, the, the line that I, like, especially for this, this coming year while I chair the committee, um, my, my, my sort of core distinction that I've been trying to make is could an end user write code that is compatible with both the old and the new version without using if defs? That, that is sort of the, the, the line that I'm trying to toe, you know. Um, mm -hmm. if, 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 if I can manage to, if we can manage to meet that obligation throughout, like you, you, you may have to actually be conscious of both standards or of both, both versions of the language. But I think you should be able to do it without having to use C++ to, you know, the CPP macros to, to swap around where your definitions are and all of that. Now, if, uh, that, if that imposes some sort of upper bound on the changes you can, you can include, like you can't include this new feature because it breaks too much, does that limit how quickly you can, or in some places well, where I mean, you can take the language? It does, in some sense. And uh, I'm not saying that, that that rule has to be hold forever. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just figuring that if we've got this first year of us as the maintainer of the Libraries Committee, there's, there's been enough, there's enough low-hanging fruit. Uh, and that maybe we, don't we start can... by breaking everything? Exactly. <laughs> um, so maybe this first year is that we go through and we, we take the low-hanging fruit. And then next year, there's a lot of talk about doing the split-based proposal and all, that, all of the work that goes into that. And that may even slip into this year. Um, I don't know the, the, how aggressive we can be on that. Jo uh, Joachim's been playing, been doing most of that, um, off in a little silo, and I haven't checked in. Um, so if we can get that in this year, great. But even uh, re regardless of what's going on with split-based, I think just fixing up um, that, that applicative as a superclass of monad, fixing up... Um, that we don't have, you know, two different map M's, and when you go to import data that traversable, everything has to come in qualified because it collides with everything, or data that foldable. When, if you look at the way Haskell code gets written today, foldable and traversable are just part of the culture. They're, they're something that we do. Um, and the um, existing combinators that we're sitting in the prelude are, are the dinosaurs. Uh, so...
I, this is this is all really encouraging to hear from a uh, developer who's been using Haskell for a while, especially the applicative mana uh, instance, which <laughs> which seems so trivial, but it's been you know a focal point for a long time. Uh, so that brings me to the question about the Haskell.org committee, which you're a member of, I, I, not not chairing, I presume. Yes. Um, yeah, that's uh, Jason Daggett chair, chairs that committee right now. So, what exactly, for someone who's not familiar with it, is the committee? Is that committee responsible for? So Haskell.org um, is responsible for, for the most part, just maintaining the servers, just making sure that Haskell.org, the the domain name runs, that um, the wiki stays up, that um, we have funding to run the servers through Hetzner or wherever they're hosted now. There's a number of stuff, a number of things in various places, um, and. Historically, like we used to have a lot of um, that being run by Galois, and now we've we've pulled out. That's now um, we've uh, we've set up now recently, just like within the last few weeks here, we just got set up so that we can start taking donations through SPI. Um, and so we're going to probably be doing some work on publicizing that. Uh, the main things that it, the Haskell.org stuff does is it takes the um, the money that we get from participating in the Google Summer of Code goes into the, the Haskell.org coffers. Um, for the most part, right now, we're just using that to um, uh, defray server costs and whatnot. Um, we break even a little bit ahead right now. We're still trying to figure out some more um, uh, what the charter can be to, to make better use of those funds, especially if we start looking at taking in donations. Um, and uh, Jason's been a big champion of trying to get that charter formed and figure out those roles. Um, and so, so yeah, so basically it's just infrastructure. Um, so that, that's the Haskell.org committee. It's not, it's not terribly interesting. It's just stuff that has to happen. You know, what do you do with subdomains under Haskell.org? Somebody has to decide, and that's the committee that does that. Great. So you mentioned uh, Google Summer of Code. And uh, yes. you've been involved with that for how long now? Um, so I, I joined as a mentor, I think, Five years ago, and I've been serving as the administrator for the Haskell community for the last four when Malcolm Wallace stood down. Um, so that's been it, the Haskell, uh, the the Summer of Code thing has really been sort of my way to uh, one of my ways to try and give back to the community a little bit. You know, it's been very good to me. So for those who haven't otherwise participated, otherwise you're not doing very much. I'm sorry, I lost her. I said otherwise you're not doing very much, so it's nice. Yeah, to otherwise I'm, I'm I'm slacking off completely. <laughs> For those who haven't participated in a Google Summer of Code, um, what's it like with the uh, the Haskell.org Summer of Code? Um, it's actually so as a student or as a mentor. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how 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 to, how to phrase this? Um, so as a mentor, um, it, it's. It's not as onerous as it might seem, you know, having a student that you interact with, you know, a few hours a week just to kind of keep them on track um, and try and move things along. Um, we generally try to have a mentor and a backup mentor for most of our projects. So if you've got somewhere you've got to be or, you know, whatever, you can still make sure that your student's making progress. Um, from a student standpoint, um, we do tend to look for students who have some experience with Haskell just because um, the, the ecosystem is complicated enough that just trying to learn Haskell and do something productive in the ecosystem for the summer is very, very difficult. Um, but, uh, you know, definitely students come from all walks of life, you know? Maybe you can share a story of, of uh, something, something oh, most memorable um, thing that's happened in the Summer of Code for you. Are there any, what's, what's the most interesting thing that someone's built, the most interesting project? Um, so most most of these things are, are are small infrastructure improvements. Like we've got um, Mikhail Glushenkov, I think, is 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 working with me this summer on um, improving like parallel make inside uh, GHC um, slash Cabal. Uh, there's there's actually two proposals. One's working on GHC. One's working on Cabal. Um, what is the most interesting proposal that we had? Um, I worked with Matthew Gruen. Um, I think my first year here on the Summer of Code. To do what we what we've been calling Hackage 2.0, um, which you may have noticed hasn't yet deployed. Um, there's some work coming out of that, uh, or working on that from the the well type guys, uh, Duncan and uh, Ian have been spending some time playing around with that. I don't know now that Ian has moved on 
quite what's happening in that front. Um, though, let's see. So what else have I um, have I worked on? So there's so many projects. It's kind of hard. To, it's kind of hard to pick pick out one um, because we've probably had like 50 projects move by in the background while I've been working on this. Um, I, I tend to focus on relatively small infrastructure improvements. Uh, so my, my stories from the Summer of Code are relatively boring. Uh, well, you mentioned Package 2. Um, maybe it'd be worth just mentioning what that is for those who don't know. So Matthew Gruen um, spent some time trying to... So Hackage was just sort of, sort of evolved into its current state. It wasn't really designed. Um, and so it really wasn't very maintainable or extensible in its current design. Um, so Gruen went off and redesigned the whole um, the whole implementation of it, made it restful, like actually followed you know best practices and all that kind of stuff, um, with an eye towards trying to make a version of Hackage that was a more secure but also um, enabled us to start talking about things like more social um, features like rating packages and providing feedback on documentation or it, uh, um, even making it so that like when you can upload a package you can kind of put it in there, check that it gets built correctly and then pull it out after the fact um, if, it, if it turns out not to be good. So, um, so that you can actually see what the package will look like before you actually ship it. Like, right now, the best you've got is the dry run functionality that you can use when you go to upload. And it'll say, yeah, we would reject it for this reason, but you can't say, okay, well, ship it up to the server, build it, take a look at the docs, did the docs build on the server or not, and do I have to, you know, can I replace that version? Currently, you can't. You have to push a whole new version, and that's why... You look at some of my packages, and there's 3.3.01, 3.3.02, 3. More, more embarrassing. As I'm just sitting there iterating the. Yeah, more embarrassing that you. Yeah, can and they and they never go away. Yeah, or or accidentally push to somebody else's package if you choose a name that conflicts. Yes, that, that's happened a few times too. Um, although it's 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 a surprisingly rare event. I think I I've clobbered one poor package out there. Uh, I. I will leave it nameless because I've forgotten what it was. I, I, I clobbered one, but uh, I'll leave it nameless because I just don't want to say. So. <laughs> um, why don't we... So, speaking of packages, maybe... Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, would, I would be happy to. So maybe we should uh, start talking about Lens. All right. I, I, I uh, what do you want to know about Lens? I want to know all the things, but let's start with why did you write it? Um, Lens started by accident, um, as, as, many, as many of my projects do. Um, so, so I wrote an older Lens package called Data-Lens, and uh, Data Lens was what I thought lenses should be at the time, and they were, you know, um, they were based on the... Uh, uh, co-state comonad coalgebra approach I, to lenses. I, I, I was I was hoping we could get through this without the use of the word coalgebra, but we have yeah. <laughs> so I tried that, um, and and it, and it's a it's it's really just saying if you take a if you if you if you want to a lens is just a effectively it's a pair of a getter and a setter. It's you know like a function from A to B and a function from A to B to A. It's it's a pure version of a getter setter pair where you're going to build a new object when you modify it. Um, and if you just tuple those things up, if you, if you say, well, these both were functions from A, so I can get a B and a function from B to A as the result, right. that thing on the right-hand side is the store comonad. And the fact that this, uh, that you, they satisfy the obvious laws that you want to get or set or pair to satisfy is so what you, makes it a uh, comonad coalgebra. So you've got the, 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 the pair of getter and setter, and they both start with an A, so then you can extract the A out. Exactly. So you pull that out, you factor that out of the com out of both functions. And that's why the, that's why the definition looks strange. Yes, that's that's what the old data lens lenses were. That that's in order to work with that, you had to put it inside of a data type, then you made a category instance for it, and you could compose them, and things worked pretty well. Um, the the problem with it is is like if you had a tuple and you wanted to change the type of the second member of a tuple or something like that, you couldn't do that with that kind of lens. Um, and um, 
Along the way, um, well, way back in the day, uh, Tuan van Larhoven came up with this another representation of lenses, which was just kind of a cute trick, where you can you can throw a functor into the mix, and then you use the strength of the functor to move data underneath it, and then since it, it's a pain in the butt. Um, but if if you say I don't care what functor you have, but you give me a function from a to f of a, and I will give you a function from s to f of s, the only way that I can deal with that is to take the s apart into something that has an a and some other stuff. I can feed the a to the function, and then I'll get out an f full of a's that I can tuple back up with the rest of the stuff in s and rebuild my s, so I can get an f of s. Since I can only get under the function once. Uh, under the functor once, that's all you can do. Um, and that's that's Twan's representation. It's a function from A to F of A to S to F of S. But if you look at that, that's a function from values that are of the same shape. And so when you go to compose those, you can compose those with dot from the prelude, and id from the prelude becomes the identity lens. Um, and the nice thing about that is, is that you didn't need anything magic. Functor was provided by base id is provided by base, dot is provided by base. All of these things are just using combinators and types that are available to you in the prelude. So if you adopt this form of lens, it turns out that you can provide lenses without actually needing to depend on my lens package. And you can define combinators that can work with those lenses um, without depending on my lens library. Um, and so what happened was um, I was talking to um, Russell O'Connor about this. And he went off and wrote a library called Lens Family based on this. And there's another co a couple of consequences of this. If you allow the, the types to change, if this becomes A to F of B and this S to F of T or something like that, then you can actually do type changing assignment. There turns out to be a family representation and all this complicated nonsense. You can talk about indexed co-state co-monad, indexed co-state co-monad co-algebroids. It becomes terrible um, if you want to if you want to ramble on in pseudo category theoretic. <laughs> Well, this but, leads me um, to a, go ahead. Um, so, but but what you can do with this, and the, what the, the the nice thing about it is, if you start varying the constraints that you put on that f in there, um, if you allow that to be applicative, you get the definition for traverse directly, and then we come up with this notion of a traversal, or what Russell called a multi lens, um, where so a traversal you, is a lens that can have multiple targets. So if you give more structure to your, your functor, you get more properties for your, for your lens. Yes, or if you take some away. Like if you actually just say that if, 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 if I only work for things that are both a functor and contravariant, then I know that that functor doesn't use its argument. Right? And so what happens is that a to f of a, a, to, f of a to s to f of s becomes effectively a to r to s to r, and that's a, um, if you, this is for all r, so if you flip that around, that's a CPS function from s to a, that's a get. You're also flipping me off right now, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I, that, was, that was a thumb. Uh, maybe it was. Oh. Um, no, this leads me to a question that I've been wanting to ask you for a while, uh, which is, which is a, about as, as, um, as formal, which is the, the type definition for lens is lens stab. Yes. Is, is, is stab... Uh, is, it's, is it supposed to be stab? So what happened was it was originally lens A, B, C, D. Um, and that was the way, I, that was the definition I used when I gave the talk out in uh, California about them. And then um, Shakaf uh, Benkiki uh, attended the, the talk on that and said, you know, that this doesn't work very well because when you actually go to, like, unify the types with the types of traversal, you have to, re like, C and D become the type arguments A and B for traverse. Mm -hmm. And then the A and the B become the F of A and the um, F of B. And it's like you have to you have to do capture avoiding substitution in your head in order to make the types unify. Um, it, it's just it's just you have to you have to be careful about the order in which you 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 do all the unification. So so he convinced me that the second argument should be A and B. Right. Um, and then the question becomes, does it become C, D, A, B? And then, um, then people would just ask you why it's not in order. <laughs> but we, we, the other reason why we switched uh, all the way to S, T, A, B was that S becomes the type parameter, uh, the state parameter, when you use any of the lens combinators that take state. So, like, uh, and then T is just the letter after S. And so what happens is, is that if you do, like, plus equals, it takes a lens from S to A with a num constraint on A. And it's operating inside a state monad. 
Yes. So that's where the S comes in. Exactly. So uh, yeah, that, I, that I was, understood that much. Of what it was did. just to minimize the amount of substitution you had to do in your head when you were reasoning about these type signatures. Okay. Um, so that's where stab came in. And then uh, it, it got pretty bad because like, when we started working around with pure profunctor lenses, we started getting papsed and um, we, a stab. And like at one point in time, it's all but said, I must stab you. And you know, <laughs> like, we, 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 we decided to take a step back. Um, from from that front because we started getting scared. so right. so speaking um, of sta- taking a step back maybe uh, for for the working Haskell developer who doesn't have the theoretical background what does mm-hmm. lens provide for them so somebody described lens the other day as jQuery for ADTs um, and I thought that was a particularly apt um, description it uh, they you know the the idea of lens is it, it gives you it, we already know how to work with functors. We know how to work with traversables. We know how to work with foldables and all these things. Um, what Lens does is it makes those building blocks composable. Um, if I want to go into a list of tuples, into a map, into a something, and if I want to walk into nested data structures using whatever complicated system of things that I have, uh, Lens lets me work in one vocabulary under all of those things. So the, the jQuery selector mechanic where you acquire a selection for some parts of the DOM, and then you can filter or descend inside that and things like that. Exactly. Um, and so that's what Lens gives you, is it gives you that sort of consistent vocabulary that you can use across lots of different things um, inside so, of the ADT. To, to be clear, so, you're, so, not, you're not limited to just a tree here. You're talking about anything with a traversable or foldable instance as well. But well, Traversable and foldable is, is one thing, but we also have other, other lenses. Like, um, if I want to edit the fifth element of a list... Like, although if you're ever editing the fifth element of a list, you're probably using the wrong data structure. Um, you can just use X. You know, there's a there's a there's a lens that will do that, or a traversal that will do that. Um, and so, the nice thing about them is is that you can you can walk into maps and containers, and uh, um, we have generic programming based lenses that can do this. Um, so things like um, Lens includes a copy of a version of a library called Uniplate from Neil Mitchell. And um, the Lens version of Uniplate runs about 30% faster than Neil Mitchell's original version. And the, the reason it can do that is because it gets to take advantage of the fact that it uses a traversal rather than building up this big ADT full of pairs of things and then pulling it back out of that, con- that representation. Uh, we let the compiler do all the work for us. Um, but the nice thing is, is that the Uniplate combinators that are in Lens Mean that if you give me any traversal that knows how to get like the same like an expression out of your expression, the immediate sub expressions out of like an expression language, you can use the uniplate combinators that we have to go through and say, well, I want to write a rewrite rule that says, I don't know, I have a syntax tree here and I, I want to go in there and look for negated like if I have neg of a literal, I want to turn that into the literal that is the negated number. You know, so like you can use you can use uniplates for tree rewriting or tree annotation or things like exactly. that. Exactly. So that's you can cool. just go through and say, hey, um, rewrite, which is a combinator that's provided by Lens. Um, here's the function that I want to apply wherever I can. Go down, bottom up, rewrite the whole syntax tree, mm-hmm. applying this rule until you can't apply it anymore. But again, obviously not just trees. Anything traversable? Anything traversable that's, well, it's anything self, not traversable, anything that, that, that has an uh, instance of what we call plate. Right. Uh, where plate has a, takes a traversal as a, a, it, it provides a traversal that knows how to, say, get an expression out of an expression. So something that knows how to get the immediate expression, uh, sub-expressions. And if you write that definition for plate, um, it will look a lot like you were writing a traverse instance, like, like you were writing the instance for traversal, except instead of finding the value, the A's in the EXPA or something like that, you're just going to find the sub-EXPAs. So it's, it's, the code will look almost like you were writing a traverse definition, a definition for traverse. Um, and if you don't know how to provide that sort of thing or don't want to provide it directly, um, there's generic programming versions of these things that will use uh, data.data or uh, GHG generics to go find uh, sub-expressions for you. So that reminds me of one of my experiences using lenses, which is if you want to, for instance, write uh, a, a composed lens or even, uh, for instance, alias uh, sub-1 to sub-x, for XY tuples? No, no monomorphism restriction is your friend. You need uh, that, but also deriving the type so that you can make uh, Warnall shut up. 
is there a, what's the simplest type you can write for something like that? And how would um, you go about... Well, really, you, it's just, you it's usually just the fact care? that at the top level, um, every lens definition is going to be a higher-order function. And, um, because, uh, every, every, like, a lens itself is, is still a rank one type, but the, put the putting the lens signature on it makes it rank two because it winds up with the... Um, because the lens alias has a for all in it. I, I, I think um, for me, one of the things that was um, scary, I guess, about using lenses was that when you ask for GHC to derive the type of things like that, GHC is <laughs> is terrible at preserving type aliases. And then I you really, and then you I read really that. I really wish it was better. I really wish it was better at that. Um, and so, I mean, if you look at the Haddocks for lens, uh, I go out of my way to provide like a dozen virtual type signatures for most of the combinators and lens that you can think about them as having um, just because to try and reduce the terror factor but if you're just trying to interact with lens from GHDI and you don't have access to the Haddox you're gonna flounder. And but um, you can do a lot with lenses without ever writing your own. Yes and you can and you can do a lot with lenses without really understanding what the types mean. Uh, that's something that I, I, I didn't expect that when I wrote the library. I wrote the library for me. Um, I wrote the library as a so I wrote. Uh, so I mentioned before that um, I had written Data Lens, and I thought that was the way to go. And then I worked with uh, Russell O'Connor, and we found that we could do type changing assignment. Um, there's some posts on the internet about this that that we did. Um, and if you get rid of the new representation, and it, um, I so so Russell went off and wrote a library called Lens Family, and I just didn't like the design of Lens Family. Um, nothing personal, Russell. Um, and, uh, so I was working on, I had a little game physics engine that I got bored and started playing with. And so I wrote my own little, um, uh, like, it, it's actually, the, the, the core of that physics engine is online as a package called Linear right now. It's just the, just the linear algebra machinery that was in there. And Linear is a linear algebra library that's designed around lenses. And that, by the way, gives you two-dimensional vectors. It gives you two-dimensional, three-dimensional, uh, awesome. Kluger space and quaternions and all. I sorts was of actually things. up until now unaware that you wrote that. That's awesome. So, so I put I put linear out there, and um, but 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 in the process of writing linear, or well, what was then called physics, because um, I was building a little two D slash three D physics engine for a, a toy project. Um, I, uh, I I wanted a little lens representation in it. I didn't want to depend on lens family because it was just convoluted. So I just wrote a, like a 20-line lens implementation. And it was so useful that I, I eventually factored it out into a separate package. And um, I let Dan Dole convince me for once to kind of break my usual rule of build a Haskell 98 package and then build a package that's got one extension and then another extension. So you need eight packages or whatever to, to use anything of note, and to just bundle it all in one thing. Um, because Lens Family already existed, so if you wanted the fully factored out package, you could always go to Lens Family. Um, and along the way, um, I came up with versions of, like, notions of getters and setters and things like that that are compatible with the Lens notion um, that the ones that we have today, you know, get, uh, getters and folds and traversals, um, we came up with an early version of what was then called a projection and is now called a prism. Uh, which yeah, I, wa is... I wanted to talk to you about that as well, so this is good. So, yeah, okay, so um, I guess the what are a prism or what are prisms kind of things? Well, uh, there, there, are, there, are, there are more tutorials out there now for getters and setters and traversals, uh, but there are some, some types in the lens package like prisms that aren't getting much love. So I, okay. I was hoping you could maybe talk about what it's doing there. So, 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 uh, if you look at a lens, a lens is about, about splitting some bigger, like, type, let's, like, say, you know, let's take apart, a, like, a whole thing and break it into, a, like, some part of it that I want to focus in on, and some other stuff, right? Um, so, it's like, you know, I can break S up into, there exists some C, such that I can get a C and an A, you know? So, I get the A, and I've got some other stuff that I'm going to rebolt on after I modify the A to some other A. Um... And so, so a lens is about breaking down a value into a product where there exists some information on the other side. A prism is about breaking something down into a sum. And what that means is a prism is like a first-class pattern. So when you say sum and product... Could uh, you... I, mean either, I mean comma or either. 
or, or product being uh, kind of, yeah. So may, may, maybe product types and some types would be what, what Haskellers are familiar with there. Yes. Uh, and so what, what, I, what happens is, is a, as a lens is about saying that um, I can construct the whole thing from the, the target of a prism. I can construct a whole either from the, the target of the, the left prism. Or I can pattern match on an either and see if I can get it back out. And so a prism turns out to be a valid traversal. So you can use the underscore left prism as if it was traverse left or something like that. You know, the, the traversal that you don't get to write when you write traverse on an either. Um, and we can... Uh, how do I explain... So, so prisms turn out to be as fundamental as lenses. They're 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 co lenses. Uh, <laughs> of course they are. <laughs> of course they are. Everything's. About if you that. if you I, my, my experience is that if you stick the word co in front of any of these things, you'll you will invent something useful somehow. Yeah, and you'll find a library <laughs> that I had to put online somewhere because nobody else had it. Um, so can you can you give a motivating example for prism? <laughs> sure. Um, control exception lens is probably the best example of using prisms aggressively. Um, control exception lens in the in the lens in package. anger. Yes, it, it's it's all about using um, uh, prisms in anger. And the, the the sort of motivation is is that if you if you use control exception, almost always you have to turn on scope type variables or um, manually you know put some type signatures inside your code in order to actually get it to type check. Because catch under control exception. Catch it's like IOA to an E to IOB to or to IOA to, to IOA, right? And then the E is any exception type. And an exception type is basically a prism into some exception. It's a um, it's a typable thing that we can inject into the some exception uh, data type. Um, and it and it has to be showable. It's it's basically typable and showable, and that's all it requires. Um, and the problem is, is that you have to pick the E in negative position. So you have to put like a type signature on it to say which E you meant. But there's no reference of E anywhere like as an argument being passed to that function. So unlike catch, what we have is we have a combinator called catching in the uh, control exception lens that takes a, um, actually what turns out to be an any fold um, that knows how to get some value out of some exception. Um, and then what we have is we have a number of prisms that look at uh, parts of some exception, like the arith, or what is it, like stack overflow exception would be an example. So there's like an underscore stack overflow um, uh, prism that you can just say catching stack overflow, and then you do the action that you want to do and the function from the, you know, from whatever stack, I think it's unit or whatever, to the thing. Um, but you didn't have to put a type signature in negative position. Um, and the other things that you can do is you can now say catching stack overflow dot filtered or you know or not stack overflow. Let's do something that has like catching error call dot filtered, and then you can start providing conditions that you want to put on that that case that you're catching. Okay. Um, and then and since it forms a prism, we can construct some exception from uh, any one of the exception types that we have lying around. Um, and so what happens is that control exception lens goes through and provides prisms for all of the standard exception types. Um, and so, and it makes a much easier to use API than control exception does. Um, and more importantly to me, um, it goes out of its way to enable you to construct things that you cannot construct with the existing exception API. Like it has this notion of, like, um, we have this notion of a handler inside of uh, control exception. And the handler um, is just like the tupled up, or it's just like that, that function from E to IOA bundled up into a data type. And what, what you can do is you can say, here's a list of handlers. I want you to, to try and catch all of these things simultaneously. Um, and that becomes, like, there, there's, a, there's, there's a single combinator for doing that. You just say, you know, take the IO action you want to run, the list of handlers that you want to execute against it, and we'll we'll try and dispatch them. But the but they don't fail over from one to the next. And um, when you go to um, you can't 
filter in a handler normally. But with the control exception lens machinery, because we do some horrible things using my reflection library and some other stuff, um, we're able to make it so that you can make things that can catch an exception like error call, but only if the string looks like this. And still gracefully maintain all those handler invariants and all that. Um, that's an example of the kind of thing that you can do with control exception lens. Um, and some of it's because I'm willing to go off and do all this horrible reflection machinery and build everything up. Um, so that uses prisms in anger. Um, another example of using prisms in anger uh, would be uh, if you go to like github.com slash ermine dash language, we have a, the beginnings of a compiler for a language that we have called ermine that we work with at uh, McGraw Hill Financial. And um, it's a language I designed a few years ago, which is basically Haskell with row types. And um, in the compiler itself, we use prisms fairly aggressively. Um, we have a we have a more or less like a two level unifier in the style of Figaris and Sheard and uh, or is it Figaris and Sheard? Uh, oh, it's Sheard, I think. Um, uh, Sheard style two level unifier. And and in there, we have to figure out whether or not like uh, an expression inside of an ADT was built with just the var constructor. And we do that by using the prism to to identify which things were built directly. Um, we, we've, we've got a lot of these things floating around in the wild. You know? um, another example of using prisms fairly heavily is um, lens-eson um, for, for Brian O'Sullivan's eson library. Gives you a set of prisms that can work with uh, JSON ADTs. Um, and then you can just go through and say, well, I want in this object this key, in this array, this element, keep going, and you can just chain them all together and manipulate portions of a JSON and ABT. And why do those need to be prisms? Um, because if you work out... Uh, it has to be a prism because it's part of a sum type. <laughs> there's there's <laughs> many different cases that it could be. It could be, you know, an int or, a, or, a, a, or an array or an object. It's one of a sum. Therefore, it's a prism. It's, there, there isn't another construction. Um, possible for it. So they're, they're, they're forced to be prisms by the theory. Yeah. Um, and so the, some nice things about the way the Lens API works out is that you get um, prisms and lenses both, both wind up being like a subtype of the notion of an isomorphism. And so if you have an isomorphism, you can use it as a prism or as a lens, and it just works. Okay, what's an isomorphism? Um, an isomorphism is just uh, like... A is isomorphic to B if I can convert A into B and then B back into A and I don't mm -hmm. lose any information in the process in either direction. Um, and then you just wrap that up in a type. Yes. So okay. an isomorphism in lens is built using some crazy profunctor machinery. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure everyone knows exactly how that works now, so let's not explain it. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the nice thing is, is that the way lens went about that, um, you can just use an isomorphism. Like if you, if you know how to convert an A into a B and a B into an A, you can use that directly as a lens to get a B out of an A, or vice versa. You, and the nice thing about isomorphisms is you can turn them around, so you can get, an, mm -hmm. you can get a lens in the opposite direction, quote unquote. So ISO gives you from and things like yes. that. Yes. Um, and you can compose a bunch of isomorphisms and then flip the whole chain or do things like that. And can you give me a motivating example for isomorphisms? Um, every new type constructor you've ever had. Uh, Fair enough. <laughs> uh, so every every new type constructor can be turned into an ISO and just works. Um, we use we use a lot of ISOs in. Uh, let's see here. Oh, um, here's a good one. Uh, text. There's an isomorphism between text and string in uh, the in in Lens itself. And so what happens is, like, if you wanted to go through and work with the individual characters in a string or in a, in a chunk of text, you can use, like, any of right. uh, text. You can, uh, use an, you can use an ISO to make a string text partway through or vice versa, process it in some way, and then get it back. Exactly. I think, actually, it's packed chars or packed, uh, now that I'm thinking about it, yeah. text is the actual traversal of the elements. Yeah, so and any, of, any of text, and then what that does is internally it uses the packing and unpacking isomorphism, and then traverses right. and the And so that's where you get the packed and from packed. Yep. Where packed is a 
Pact is an isomorphism. An iso, yeah. Yeah. And then text equals text equals from pact dot traverse. I hate to interrupt this uh, this interesting discussion on on type theory, but but this brings up a question that I think a lot of new developers have who don't have the theoretical or the mathematic background uh, to that they feel intimidated by this type of discussion and getting into Haskell and looking at probably any one of your libraries would would send them running. I. I Yes. I'm I'm currently feeling intimidated. <laughs> so so, do you have any any advice for uh, for them? Don't fear the math. Um, you 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 can you can get pretty far without um, obsessing about it, but you, eventually you're probably going to want to pick up some of it. Um, I I freely admit that I sort of fetishize mathematics in my code. Um, I go off. And a lot of the constructions that I try to build, I try to find the weakest mathematical construction that I can use to describe some other thing. Um, Do you have and a lot of it is because it just lets me lean on 50 years' worth of prior work. I mean, if you look around in computer science 50 years back, the only thing you're going to find are, like, you know, Lisp and some Fortran derivatives, right? And um, you, you have formal education with the math behind this? I do. Um, I, I went off and I had a very weird academic background. Um, I went off and uh, did the dot-com thing, made and lost a lot of money um, with a ISP and a phone company way back in the day. And then um, after the dot-com crash, I, uh, I went and hid in academia and collected a bunch of degrees. And so um, I should did I, a, Should I be referring to you as Dr. Komet? No, I never, I never did my PhD. <laughs> I, I, I did... Uh, um, so I went back to school in like 2004, and then uh, 2005 I graduated with my undergrad, and then um, so that was a double bachelor's in math and computer science, and then I did a, a master's in math, a master's in computer science, um, met all the requirements for a master's in bioinformatics, audio and, and my wife's and that, and, <laughs> master's in linguistics, and then and that did, took uh, you another year. I'm yeah, that, actually it did. Um, right. So my master's in math was the next semester, and I then, feel uh, inadequate. Um, <laughs> so I left academia in 2007, uh, three years in, and um, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a great little binge. It was a great little diversion. And I discovered Haskell right around 2000, the end of 2006 when I was finishing up my computer science master's. And uh, so, so I had a master's in math, but I hadn't done any category theory at all uh, because, you know, I went to a school where category theory was generalized abstract nonsense. You know, that was sort of the, right. the, the perception of it. Um, and so when I found Haskell, I found Category Extras, which was a library that at the time was written by a guy named Dave Menendez. Um, and it was just something that he'd put together, and it had comonads in it. I didn't understand them. Um, and so I went off and started trying to understand comonads. And so I picked up some category theory. And, uh, and that could be dangerous. Comonads are like an inverted burrito, right? You've got the filling yeah, on the outside there. Yeah, it's a very messy space suit. You really don't want to eat that one. Uh, I don't know. It's, uh, I, 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 I like to view, you know, like if you view monads as being able to see a little tiny part of what you're coming from and being able to build a whole new thing and then you're going to graph together these big things. Um, a comonet is about sort of taking, you can look around you, you can see everything around you, and you're going to build a little piece, and then the, the comonet's going to stitch all those little pieces together. Um, and so there, there turns out to be a number of interesting uses of comonets. Um, there was a nice uh, post about cellular automata. Yeah, cellular automata are probably the canonical when, example. When you talk about getting the neighborhood around a thing and using that to derive the new value for a thing, that sounds a lot like cellular automata. That's exactly what it is. Um, so the automata is a great example of the store comonet. Um, and lenses turn out to be store comonet co-algebra, as you, you may recall. Uh, so there's a, <laughs> there's a nice little application there. Um, you should, one one uh, thing, I guess, that, that's worth noting, though, is that you tend to build up a bigger and bigger comonad, or a bigger and bigger monad, whereas with comonads, you tend to work with lots of little comonads. So that's why when you, when you look around, you're not going to see one comonad structuring your entire application. You may use lots of little comonetic values, though, if you really want to play with that theory. Um, a lot of people don't see the value in comonets, and I understand why, because it's really just giving you a common vocabulary for like extracting from, a, from something. Um, and you can often get away with the ad hoc you know, one-off combinator for doing that for whatever data type you're working with. And there's no sugar. 
And there's no, well, there is, um, Dominic Orchard uh, has a library called Kodu Notation, um, which I think gives a template Haskell quasi quoter or something like that that does it. Um, he wrote a paper on what Kodu, what do sugar, what Kodu sugar should look like. <laughs> um, and it turned out to be more complicated than even I thought. Um, can we can we start calling that don't sugar? Uh, you see, you know, there, there's been enough. There's ac- there's actually an Acme don't package, but it doesn't have it doesn't. It's a different uh, beast. Um, but, uh, sadly, um, uh, undo sugar was the other one. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, there, there's there's no there's no sugar for them. I don't feel that there really needs to be. Um, I mean, they they do have applications, uh, you know, just like uh, image convolution and uh, cellular automata are probably the big big ones that everyone can recognize. Um, but I use them in like um, I use them in Scala because in Scala monad transformers are terrible. And um, I have a post that I showed that every comonad gives rise to a uh, monad transformer, um, and so where monad transformers suck in Scala, I can almost always take the comonad that would induce that monad transformer, and then just pass around those comonadic values inside of my monad while I'm working. And so, like when I work with parsers for things, uh, if you look in there's a Ermine legacy parser and stuff like that 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 uses passes around comonads full of context for like what names are bound and all that stuff. Um, so I, I tend to use a lot of little comonads. But anyway, anyways, I found I found the you know this this notion of a comonad. You know that's why I've got my my blog on comonad.com, um, endlessly fascinating at the time. And um, so I I in uh, my math background, I guess you could say I'm a differential geometer. Uh, so uh, um, as a, as a you know as a geometer, you know the, the, like you know coming from like projective geometry, etc. Dualities are a big deal to me. And so I really like finding the dual of everything. Um, <laughs> and it noticed. turns out, like it turns out, like just the other day, I like finally realized that my Comonad to Monad transformer is what's called a right con lift. Um, uh, it seems like Comonad. it seems like if you look for long enough, you'll find that someone in the math literature has already done what you're trying to do in Haskell. Exactly. Um, and then that gives you a body of work to sort of extrapolate from. And, and the laws are, and, and the um, and the the properties that you're able to extract from the mathematics are often not obvious. Mm-hmm. Um, because people wrote papers about them. Exactly. They were they were things that were worth writing about forty years ago, and mm-hmm. you know, you have to sometimes you know get your your archaeological hat on and you know run around pretending you're Indiana Jones or something, maybe with a fewer fewer boulders chasing you, but. But it's but it but it can be it can be it can be fun in its own right. It, it's definitely a different style of programming. Um, and uh, I mean, I I, I kind of fell into it just because I was you know I, I like I said when I found Haskell I I was kind of at that point where I was disillusioned with programming. I was like, there's nothing new under the sun. I can write another game engine, but why? You know. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and Haskell gave me something to keep me interested in programming as an art form. If I hadn't found Haskell, I don't know what I would be doing right now, because I probably wouldn't, I mean, I probably would still be programming, because it pays pretty well, but um, I probably would be doing something very different than what I'm doing now. So, Edward, let me ask you, now that we're starting to wrap up here, Sure. aside from the stuff that you've been doing, of the other maybe two or three libraries out there, what what's some of your favorite new developments in Haskell? I've seen a lot of interest in pipes, for instance. Oh, um, pipes is interesting to me. Um, I I I both love and hate pipes. Um, I've, I have my own little side project that I've been playing around with called Machines. Um, Can you call it Tubes? No, Tubes was actually Tubes was actually the running joke at the office when they came up with Machines. Um, um, machines is is very much a work in progress and and nowhere near as capable as pipes or conduit. Uh, both of those both of those have to deal with real world scenarios and and actually get things right and have to ship code. Um, I freely admit that they they have had <laughs> many times the amount of like uh, thought and effort put into them that I have with machines. Um, the the thing that 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 drives me nuts about them is just the sheer number of type parameters. Um, and so I've been trying to find like. It's it's always easy to complexify your model to to fit everything in it, um, and I'm trying to find there there there's got to be a simpler idea. 
They also don't can, have a can, catchy acronym like STAB. Yeah, there's 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 got to be some simpler construction. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not I'm not purporting to have found it. Um, and high techno. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, when I find it, damn it, I'll, I'll release a, a nicer library. Um, in the meantime, everyone will have moved on to pipes and conduit, and I, I'll have just mostly released it for my own edification. But um, so we're, you know, I'm still working on that. Uh, there's like actually, there's some work on that in Scala Z, the new Scala. Uh, there's some uh, machinery going into Scala Z that's based on the Scala implementation of machines and such. Um, but let's see. What, so so not to talk about my libraries. Who who else has written something cool? Um, there was a really cool uh, commutativity monad that was just um, that just hit Reddit the other day. That 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 kind of really struck me as a, an interesting approach to things. Uh, I thought that was a that was a particularly neat toy the other day. Um, and then Ren has been blogging about uh, some very improvements of that to uh, commutativity thing, uh, functions that are commutative over large, large lists and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know. Um, so Edward, I, I believe you're involved with the Boston Haskell group, is that correct? I am. I. I've been organizing that for probably the last three years or so since Ravi Nanavati, who was the guy who organized it before me, um, left. Um, I've been. Go ahead. Do you want to take an opportunity to promote this and and? Uh... So yes, if you're in the Boston area, um, we do Haskell meetups every third Wednesday at uh, Akamai at Eight Cambridge Center. Um, they um, they've been uh, kind enough to provide us with hosting and. Um, they come out and do their little recruiting sh- uh, spiel, like you know, once once a month. But but it's a it's a it's a pretty good group of guys, uh, well, guys and girls. Uh, we've got probably about 20, 25 people who show up. Um, we try to organize talks, but for the most part these days, it's mostly just kind of a hangout and chat session. Uh, we used to do. I used to very rigorously try to do two talks, like one intro level talk and one um, go as deep down the rabbit hole as you feel like. To talking about kind of talks. Um, can we get and, you some sponsors so you can record those, please? Uh, you know, I used to record. I have I have some of them recorded. If you go to my my YouTube account, I think it's under Edward Komet. Uh, there should be several of them recorded. Um, I've been since we've been mostly in this kind of broken up format. Um, we haven't been recording just people hanging out and chatting. Uh, mm-hmm. Um. But like recently, we did a presentation on Ermine, that that functional language that I mentioned earlier, um, that I think Renard Bjarnason recorded, uh, the vast majority of. Uh, so that that was probably the most recent talk that we've given, um, and that one was actually recorded. Um, before that, we've we we the most recent talks we haven't been recording just because my camera broke, and uh, or I, it, it didn't break. I just lost the power cord uh, somewhere in the move. So I'm going to also plug uh, lens.github.io, which oh, yes. has tutorials and wikis and things. Yes, and I need to um, I need to link the last few Lens articles that folks have written on there. Um, if, uh, if anybody can think of a Lens article that's not linked from lens.github.io, let me know, and I'll happily put a link in the RSS feed that's on there. I wonder if also there's a way to find out what people in the Haskell community are interested in learning about lenses. For instance, I'd love a write-up on Uniplate and how, how you could use that practically. Okay. Um, so. so there's been... There, I, I know the, the FP Complete guys have been kind of poking at me to, to do some lens tutorial stuff on their site. Um, so maybe get on that. <laughs> <laughs> in, my, in my infinite free time. Yes. Um, do you actually sleep? I've heard that if you don't, you can get more done. That's, that's, that's kind of the rule of thumb that I've been using. Um, so... I don't know, some, something in my brain broke around 2005 or so, and I, I was getting by on about three hours of sleep a night for until until about this year. Um, and unfortunately, that's recently changed. Um, so I'm back to sleeping. Uh, it's uh, partially because I've been, I've been exercising and losing weight and all that kind of stuff. But it, uh, it, it turns out that if you exercise for about three hours a day, um, your body wants more sleep. Um, and so I wind up having to pay that back twice, and so that's like a basically an extra full time job <laughs> out of my out of my day for the last six months or so. Um, we'll see we'll see if that uh, if that tapers off once I once I can hit maintenance or whatever. 
But uh, but yes, giving up sleep giving up sleep is a great productivity booster um, to a point. I find I actually do my best code when I'm slightly tired, and it's kind of pathetic. But it, I stop second guessing myself and trying to find all the alternatives, and I just put down the best thing that I figured out so far. Um, and so I get a lot more code written when I'm slightly tired. So. So let's let's also give a plug to uh, Comonad.com, which is your blog. Yes, um, although I will I will warn. Um, so it was recently attacked, you know, uh, by Visa spammers or something like that. And so I the the server that it was on went down because it got rooted. And uh, I just recently recovered it from a, a mirror that John Wigley put up. Um, and so it's sitting like it's hosted by GitHub right now. But if you go to like reply to any of the posts or whatever like that, they're just gonna it's just gonna fail because it's just a static site right now. Um, that's a mirror until I can get either the hosting situation that I had before um, set back up, or I can come up with something more drastic, like moving the discussions to discuss and then moving it to Octopress or something like that. Um, so yes, Comanet.com has a ton of articles, uh, mostly by me, some things by Dan Dole and by uh, Gershon Benjamin. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, if you want to if you want to play with the heavily theoretical side of Haskell, um, that that's where I've been blogging that content. I, I'm probably going to move some of my new content um, up to the School of Haskell just because they can make it a little bit more interactive for end users. So I thought I'd give you a chance to mention anything else you think is interesting, any any links you want to plug. Um, so let's see. So what have I been working on lately? Uh, so interesting things that I'm playing with right now, um, I, I don't really have a link per se, well, but I've been obsessed with this notion of things, uh, something I've been calling semi-parsing, mm -hmm. um, which is based on some work by a guy named uh, Giuseppe Ottaviano. And, uh, and Giuseppe has done, um, there's a paper on it of his called semi-indexing, um, which describes the approach. But I've been modifying that approach to work with uh, data.binary to get you a serialization format that you can um, only pay to deserialize the portions of it that you look at. Um, and so I've been, I've been working. I've been working on that um, a little bit for the last, you know, a few weeks. It's been one of my my current obsessions. Um, but you know that that's of course makes us a very uh, temporally windowed uh, session <laughs> session to, to pay attention to. So so by the time you actually get around to listening to this, if you're, uh, <laughs> it, it may be something that I've moved on completely from or not. All right, anything else? Nothing here on my side, Rain. I think that's it. I wanted to thank uh, you, Edward, for showing up. I think this was really interesting for me. I hope our, our listeners enjoyed it as well. Chris, thanks for hosting with me. I think we had a, uh, a fittingly theoretic uh, discussion for the first episode. You know, you wouldn't be a hassle. I apologize for I apologize for scaring off all of your readers or your, your viewers or listeners or what have you. Um, and... Uh, I don't think I don't. I, hopefully, your hopefully your next sessions will be uh, more intro level. No. <laughs> <laughs>